Hello and welcome back to CS11. This is lecture 16a. In this lecture we'll be taking a look at a sample program that does encrypting and decrypting of strings using a very primitive encryption technology known as a Caesar cipher. We'll talk more about that later. This is a complex program so there will actually be more than one lecture where we examine this program. In today's lecture I want to focus on uh, several concepts. First of all, the idea of modular programs, the idea of objects as a service, and command line arguments. The portion of the, the program that I want to talk about today is at the bottom and is the main function. So I'll bring that up on the screen and uh, the main function is actually just a little bit on the large size, including this comment, doesn't quite fit on the screen. So it's a bit of a stretch, so we know that this is probably about as big as main should get. Normally, we like to have any function fit on the screen so that you can always see the whole thing. And that would be true if I hadn't left this uh, comment in here. Okay, but first, let's talk about this idea of modular programs. Now, the earliest programs that we wrote this semester all fit in one function. And as we've gone farther in the semester, our programs have had additional functions. And culminating in the programs that we're working with now at the end of the semester that also work with classes and objects, which themselves can have multiple functions. So if you think of the function as a unit of a program that you know carries out certain tasks, we've gone from programs that kind of had you know one part or one moving piece to programs that have many. The idea with a program that has many parts that work together is to divide the tasks amongst the various pieces. So if you have certain tasks that you want to carry out, such as let's say we have certain tasks A, B, C, and D that we need to carry out, rather than having every piece of the program a little bit responsible for A, a little bit responsible for B, a little bit responsible for C, and so on, we want to divide up those tasks. So for example, maybe these portions of the program are responsible for task A, and these are for task B, and these C, and this is D. And whether we look at the complexity of programs that we would write in a first semester programming class like this one, or three semesters in, or whether you look at very complex programs, this same idea is going to apply of dividing authority and responsibility of the various tasks you need to carry out in various places. Now, the task that I want to talk about dividing up first is input and output, or I.O. More generally speaking, I can think of this as communication with the user of the program. And in our programs, we're using a console I.O., so text-based input coming from C in and C out. This same concept, though, is going to apply to a larger or more complex program. Maybe if we're developing a program to run for iOS, like a program for the iPhone, and you have text fields and buttons and taps and gestures and graphics and sound, this same idea is going to apply to that program as well. So the idea with this communication of uh, the user is one of the tasks the program has to carry out, we want to make sure that one portion of our program is responsible for that. So when we write a program, we would like our C in and C out commands basically to go in one place. And in a, our simplest programs, like we're doing this semester, and carrying on also into next semester, the best place for us to do that is going to be main. And so we would like main to handle the I.O. routines. So communicating to the user, gathering information through CN and dis disseminating information through C out. And then main 
can talk to the other portions of the program. And this is a really good model to follow. When you look at a program, you can look to in one place to see where that I.O. is happening. A rule of thumb that I like is that the member functions in the classes and objects that you're writing should rarely do any I.O. We don't want to take the idea of C-ins and C-outs and scatter them throughout all the different pieces of our program. Instead, we would like to have them central in one area. Okay. Well, relating to this idea is the idea of objects as services. So, in this program, if main is going to be responsible for input and output, then the class that's going to that we're going to code in this example program called Caesar is responsible for encrypting and decrypting messages. So we can think of this Caesar object as providing a service. Hi, I'm an object, and I can provide this service of encrypting and decrypting messages to the rest of your program. And so main is going to gather uh, information from the user and then can ask the Caesar object, hey, can you encode this message for me, or decode this message for me? And the Caesar object says, sure, I can, does the work, and returns information back to main, which can then share it to the, with the user. And so one helpful way, not the only way to think about classes and objects, but one way is to thinking about them as providing services to the other parts of your program. One last concept that I want to discuss before we actually take a look at that main function is the idea of command line arguments, also known as command line parameters. Now, the command line, first of all, we have to know what that is. When I say the command line, that means something very specific in the same way that if I talk about standard in and standard out, those mean very specific things. The command line is the command that you type out that invokes or executes your program. So in the terminal, when we get a prompt and you type something like dot slash a dot out or dot slash a dot exe to invoke your program, this is the command line. Now, previously, we've seen that on the command line that you can list additional information that will have an effect on the way that your program executes. Previously we talked about redirection and saw that you could do something like this to redirect standard output and you ran your program and the operating system when it's examining the command line saw this and said oh that's information for me this is a direction to the operating system to run your program, but instead of connecting standard out to the screen, I should redirect it so it connects to this file. And so the operating system sees this, knows it's a message for the operating system, and consumes it or uses that information up in order to make a change or setting. The command line, though, can also be used to pass information to your program. So here, let's put some information here. I'll say minus D4. When we invoke this program, the first thing that's going to happen is the operating system is going to look at that line and say, is there anything there for me? And it's going to look at this and say minus D4. And it's going to say, no, that's not for me. If it saw the greater than sign or less than sign in a file name, it would, it would say, oh, that's for me. But here it looks and operating system says, nope, I don't, I don't do anything with that. So then what happens to that information is it gets passed to your program when your program starts up. Well, where does it go? It goes as parameters to your main function, which makes sense. Since main is the function where the execution of your program begins, if the operating system wanted to send any information to your program, that would be the logical place for it to go. And that's what happens. 
So any information that you put on the command line, however many pieces there are, including the name of the program that you typed, gets sent to main. And so main can have two parameters, and those are called argc, which is an argument count, and that's an integer, and it tells you how many arguments were passed to the program. It will always be at least one, because the name of the program is always passed back to the program itself, but it can be higher. In this case, it would be three, one for a dot out, one for minus d, and one for the four. The second parameter that's passed to main is an array of character arrays, arg v for argument values. And it typically looks like this, char star arg v array brackets. This system was set up long before the string class was ever created. So to pass these strings are all sent as character arrays. In the sample program, I've shown show you the syntax for working with these and show you enough that you will be able to work with them even if you don't feel comfortable working with, with character arrays, which you may not. In C++, we normally prefer to use the string class as much as possible, but there are times where using character arrays is required, and this is one example of one of those times. When you want to work with command line uh, parameters, you have to work with character arrays, not strings. Okay, well let's take a look at the uh, program and talk about how this main function is working. Okay, so here's our main function, it has integer return type, and here for the first time we're looking at some parameters in main. They have to come in this order. They should always be called argc and argv. Those are universally known names. Everyone that sees them will know exactly what those are. argc is the argument count, which is an integer, and argv are the argument values, which should be include a star here, an asterisk, and then array brackets. And that's because this is actually a two-dimensional array, because there's one character array for each of the values, so it's actually an array of arrays. Okay, so this program here that we're writing requires the user to give it certain information. Well, why do we want to have command line parameters at all? Well, it's a very convenient way of starting up a program and having it switch into different modes. It's a different way of getting information into the program. And an advantage over having a program just read as input is that you can invoke the program and use input for different purposes. So in this sample program, we're going to pass the program, first of all, a code of either minus D or minus E, and then a numeric amount. And the, we're going to use in this program either the minus D or minus E options to determine whether this program should be decrypting secret messages or encrypting them. And the numeric amount that comes after this is going to tell us by how many positions should we shift the letters as we're encoding and decoding them. So that will affect also the encrypting or decrypting process. So that's one, two, three parameters. And this program, when it starts up, is going to check and make sure that when you ran it, you gave it exactly those three pieces of information. So that's the first thing that main does here. If argument count doesn't equal three, so if it didn't get three pieces of information, this program is going to print out an error message reminding us, here's how you're supposed to use the program. The name of the program, so that's argv0, and then a minus sign, and then either a D or an E, and then the shift amount. So that's not complete documentation, but it's a little reminder. So if you, you know, run the program and haven't used it for a while and come back to it later and run it again and didn't quite remember how to run it, then this message will print out and be like, oh yeah, that's how I have to run that program. 
If that isn't enough, then you have to consult the full documentation for the program. Okay, so if the argument count isn't three, we print out an error message, and then I use this exit command, exit one, and that will halt the program immediately. And so then the per user can run the program again. Okay, well, if as main continues, at that point, we then know that our C or argument count is exactly three, so that we know that we have exactly three arguments. So that would be argv0, this would be argv1, and this one here would be argv2. Okay, so here I'm creating an integer and I'm using the a to i function, which we talked about previously, which converts a character array to an integer on argv2. So whatever value you put here, for example, 17, is read in as a character array, and then the a to i function will convert that to an integer, numeric 17, and store it in this variable here, shift amount. Now this program here doesn't have any particular error checking. Okay, then here I'm setting up a Boolean variable called encrypt, and we're going to set that to either true or false, depending on whether the user wants to encrypt or decrypt their messages. Here, I am going to take the character array that was passed in here, for argument v1, and I'm going to convert it to a string. This is one way to do it. If you create a new string variable with some name and give it in parentheses one of your character arrays, then it will create a new string that has the same contents as that character array has. Then here I've got a couple of other strings that we're going to use, a line and encoded line, and then he Next, we're going to check this option string, and I'm going to check to see if it's minus E. And if so, I'm going to set encrypt to be true. Otherwise, I'm going to set encrypt to be false. So I didn't notice I didn't check here for minus D. I just checked to see if it was minus E. And if it wasn't minus E, then I assumed it was minus D. Uh, if you, the user typed in something else, like minus X, then they'll get minus D. If we didn't want that behavior, then we could explicitly check for minus E, minus D, and if it wasn't either of those, then print out some kind of error message. Here is where I'm creating one of the Caesar objects. So not in this video, but in the next video, we'll take a look at the Caesar class defined in, at the top of this file that creates an object that can encrypt and decrypt strings. So here I am creating one of those objects, which I'm going to call cipher, and I'm passing it some information, the shift amount. And that information is going to go to the constructor for the Caesar class, specifically on this cipher object, and it's going to use that information to remember to initialize that object. The shift amount remember, is the value that the user put in that represents how the encryption object should do its work. And so then in turn, that information is passed to the cipher object so it can configure itself initially in a certain manner. Okay, then this program is going to have a loop here, and here it's using an input command to control this while loop. So remember, that means that this loop here will continue as long as there's more input. And what this loop here does is it's going to get all the lines of text that you input. And if you have requested encryption, it's going to ask the cipher object to encrypt the string. And so, in effect, what this is going to do is set encoded line to be the encrypted version of the string that you just entered. And if uh, encryption is false, then it will take whatever you typed in and decrypt that string. In either case, whether it's taken your input and either encrypted it because you typed in an, your original message or because you typed in some encoded text and wanted to decode it, it will then output the encrypted or decrypted version of your input and then continue with the loop. When you're done with input, prime drops out and terminates.
Let's actually run this program and I can show you what it does. Okay, we're compiling. All right, let's run the program. And, oh, look, I forgot to put in the information on the command line. So it's reminding me to do that. So I'll do that. Let's encrypt a message. So we'll put in minus E. And let's shift the message by 1. And now we'll put in a test. Hello, how are you? And we get this message back. All right, let's do control D to mark end of file. So there is the output of this program. Let's copy that and let's run the program again. This time, let's ask it to decrypt a message. And I'll paste that in and I'll hit enter. And there's the output of the program. Okay. So here we have a quick run and we can see that we were able to type in some input and encode a message and then later we could switch from encoding to decoding and get our message back. All in uppercase, notice we don't have any punctuation or white space left in the message. Now you have to use the same number and opposite parameters for this to work so let's take this message one more time and let's run the program and let's ask it to decode a value with two and paste the message in and notice that doesn't work. We don't get our original message back. Let's do one more test. Let's encode a message with a shift of 13. Okay. And here is our output. Let's copy that. And control D. And let's run the program again. And let's decrypt. And I'll paste my input. And there we can see the output. And control D. All right. Well, that wraps up this video. In the next video, we'll focus on the Caesar object itself. And we'll talk about how it is working.